Hello and welcome once again to Wrestling Memories Then and Now on Pioneer 90.1 FM KSRQ. You can find us too online at RadioNorthland.org. That's where you can stream us live right now if you're listening live to Wrestling Memories on Sundays at noon in the Central Time Zone. Or if you want to listen to it later, you can also go to the website. Go to the Wrestling Memories page within the RadioNorthland.org page and we are there, there, and you can check out all the episodes. Six years, now we're on our seventh season. So many great Wrestling Memories Then and Now now to be recorded. It's a lot of fun, RadioNorthland.org, and you can also check out uh, YouTube. Uh, we're starting to uh, put up some episodes of Wrestling Memories as well. Uh, I'm not doing that. Uh, I'm Glenn Broggett, by the way. Uh, my co-host, uh, the man uh, in the moment, is the guy handling uh, the, the YouTube end of things. Things have gotten a little bit cooler down there deep in the heart of Texas where he has his mobile studio. Uh, this time of year, it, it's not exactly the kind of weather where you're going to be frying eggs on the uh, uh, on, on the uh, hood or anything like that, but I do bid a kind welcome to my partner in crime, Mr. Michael McCurdy, the grizzled veteran himself, my friend. Are we ready? Are we raring to go for another edition of Wrestling Memories then and now? We're always good to go for another week of Wrestling Memories, man, especially when it's a nice 65 degrees out here. So, like you said, I'm not dying. No, so I, once again, Kenny Boland doesn't have to send out the uh, rescue party. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. He had us uh, all quite worried. The GoFundMe uh, was about ready to get greenlit before uh, everything was all uh, smoothed out. And then you had to let him know for the ninth time that you'll you'll be okay. Yeah, it's uh, not exactly uh, 65 up here at the day of the recording as we're getting down to business. It's about 30, 35 degrees. We had uh, a few inches of snow, a good four to six inches of snow. So, yeah, we, we're not ready for this winter uh, business just yet. So I, I take your 65 every time. You can keep that snow. <laughs> I don't want that. Well, my friend, we've got a great guest lined up today, uh, and boy, you've done some great booking. I always tell people, you know, there's some weeks when uh, I'm, I'm handling it, doing the solo flight with a guest. I mentioned that the uh, the grizzled vet, Mike McCurdy, is out on assignment, and he's never on vacation. He's on assignment. And you have managed to meet up and, and get us hooked up with a very unique guest, and this is going to be a very fascinating edition of the program. And I'm going to let you uh, give a, give the intro. I'm going to let you uh, kind of ease in with the questions because this is a guest that you found, and I, I truly appreciate it too, and I'm ready to uh, throw in a few questions here or there. But this one will be your baby, my friend. So I'm going to let you do the intro, kick back, enjoy, and chime in whenever I can. But I'm not quite going to hide under the ring or fall asleep, so I'll be here, man. So don't worry about it. All right, man, like you said, we've got a unique perspective on uh, some wrestling memories this week. Because, you know, Glenn, when you look at wrestling history, when you talk about tag team wrestling, you talk about the fabulous Freebirds. They're oh. definitely one of the ones at the top of the list. Oh, absolutely. When you talk about the greatest rivalries in professional wrestling, you talk about the fabulous Freebirds against the Von Erichs, all that, you know, top, number five. It's in the top ten any list all over the world. Oh, it was, it was a you classic know, you feud. You talk about wrestling. Exactly. It, you talk about wrestling right here in the great state of Texas. You have to talk about the fabulous Freebirds. These men were called legends, but Glenn, our guest today, she called one of them dad. Oh, That's that, right. Oh, this we is... are talking to none other than the daughter of Terry Bam Bam Gordy. And you know what? The newest resident of Bad Street USA. She's just now starting to make her mark on the indie scene here in the Fort Worth area. So please welcome to Wrestling Memories, Miranda Gordy. Miranda, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Anytime, you know, we're always, we always want to share the wrestling memories and all that. And, you know, like I said, you're, you're, you're going to have a more unique perspective because, you know, you grew up, you basically, you grew up Gordy, you know, your father, as I said, legend in wrestling tag teams, you talk rivalries, you know, Terry Bam Bam Gordy, one of the all time legends of the sport, one of the greatest big men of the sport, you know, and this was your father. So I'm just going to go right in with the questions of, you know, what was it like, you know, as a child growing up and all that, basically growing up Gordy as a member of the Gordy family, you know, knowing who your father was, what was, what was life like? Um, well, you know, I just saw him as my dad. I didn't see him, you know, as like the great, uh, you know, Terry Bam Bam Gordy. I was like, Hey, this is my dad. He needs to, you know, get me some ice cream or <laughs> he needs to, <laughs> you know, so, um, it's a little, uh, different, you know, but I, um, of course, watched him, I went to the shows and stuff. Um, growing up, Gordy, a lot of wrestling. Uh, there's wrestling all throughout my family. Um, you know, my brother, Ray Gordy, he wrestled too. So um, it was just really big um, growing up with that. 
Um, but it was awesome to grow up Gordy. So um, everybody loved my dad, and I got to see that as a kid, which was which was amazing. It's it's awesome to see that as a kid. Now, as a child, you know, like you said, growing up, you know, you see him, he's dad. You know, hey dad, can I have can I have some ice cream? Or you know, you did something wrong. Dad's going to be the one that you know sends you to your room, or you know, he grounds you for a couple of days. But to the rest of the world, he was, you know, he was Terry Gordy. He was Terry Bam Bam Gordy. Dr. Dusty Steve Williams, tag team partner, member of the Fabulous Freebirds. What was it like, you know, as far as from a fan perspective? Because you saw him in a different light. But what was it like knowing that your father was such a, a legend and such was so enamored in people's eyes? Well, I mean, it's awesome to know that. You know, it it makes my heart smile, I guess. Um, it's just really awesome. And, like, I love, you know, looking back on the videos because, I mean, I'm not just biased, like, it's a fact. He was, you know, one of the greatest. And so when you watch it, it's like watching an artist at work. And, and so it makes me happy, like, to think about it. And, um, like I said, you know, fans coming up and telling me stories and stuff. And, and that just, like, I love that so much. And, you know, I can live vicariously through them. And, um, you know, just knowing, like, hey, that's my dad. Like, I'm his biggest cheerleader. So, <laughs> so, Yeah. At what age did you uh, did you first learn, or did you know, you know, who your father was, or what your father did? Oh man, I wouldn't even know because it just he, he was just you know always a wrestler. So um, just from the time I can remember, um, and actually when I was a kid, what I you know everybody talks about the you know the Von Erichs, the Freebirds. Um, I was born in '89, so I'm a little bit younger. Um, my dad was actually uh, really focusing on all Japan at the time. So I grew up like, you know, with the Stan Hansen and the Bruce Brody and the, you know, Giant Baba and stuff like that. And so that's kind of more what I grew up with first. Um, and then, of course, you know, when I start actually like learning, learning about the history, that's when I got into the Von Erickson and everything with the, the world class show. Now we'll we'll talk about uh you know his tag team because over in Japan you know like I said obviously over there he was a huge star teaming with Doctor Death Steve Williams in an aspect another great tag team you know you look at it your father is probably a member of two of the greatest some of the greatest tag teams between his pairings with Michael Hayes and Buddy Roberts and with Doctor Death Steve Williams I got to meet Steve at Cauliflower Alley a few years back and he had nothing but great things to say about your father and talking with a lot of the guys around here in Texas area, you know, James Beard, talking with Kevin Von Erich, um, Terry Garvin, Bill Cobble, all these other men, they never had anything negative. Nobody ever had a bad thing to say about your dad. Your, your father was always what a friendly guy he was, what a great guy he was in the ring, what a pleasure he was to work with. Is this the, what you've, you've experienced? Because it's hard to have a, a career and not have somebody have something negative, but – Honestly, I've never heard anything bad about your father. You know, honestly, I was just thinking about that the other day because I'll go through, like, other, you know, people's interviews and stuff, and and it's like no one really had a bad thing to say, and I don't have anything, you know, awful to say either. Like, there's – he was just, like, a big teddy bear to me. You know, so, like, he, he was genuinely nice to everyone. Like, you, you had to be going out of your way to make him mad. He had a, morals, and, and you know, so he, he wanted to help people out. Like, he was a genuinely nice guy. So, you know, if, if you have something bad to say, you, you probably did it to yourself, is, <laughs> is how it is. So, but he was, like, it, it's genuine. He was a genuinely nice guy. Yeah, as large as your father was, I don't think he's a man I'd ever want to make angry. I mean, he was he was he was a big man. It's, it's legit when you say he was one of the best big men in the ring. He was he was legit a powerhouse in that ring. I would, you know, the old world class opening. You see a clip of your father launching a guy into the third row who decided, hey, I'm gonna cross the ropes. That's a famous scene. Everybody's seen a clip of that at some point in time or another. I don't think I'd want to cross your dad. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah that's one of my my favorite uh little scenes where he pushes the guy but like i said that guy had been asking for it all night 
he'd been rude and and you know once you cross the line it's you know no holds barred like you're you're done so <laughs> so he was asking for it so he got it <laughs> so looking back what would what are some stories you could share of uh you know Terry Gordy as you know your father Terry Gordy not Bam Bam but your father what are some of the memories that you know you can share Oh man, oh, where to start? There's there's so many. I mean, just hanging out with him, you know, being a dad, like school functions and stuff. Of course, uh, him being Terry Gordy, there was always someone that wanted to come say hi. And um, like I remember uh, someone had recognized him. We got a free pizza. <laughs> um, I thought that was pretty cool. But uh, there's just like... The other night, um, I was going through pictures and stuff, and it's me as a little kid, and I'm putting rollers in his hair. Like, he's just sitting on his chair, and I'm putting the, you know, hair rollers in his hair, and my mom just happened to take a picture, and, you know, that's just one of those memories that, you know, I think about forever, um, this big guy with, with rollers in his hair. Um, you know, he'd take us everywhere, like, to the skating rink or – like playgrounds or, you know, just, just hang out at the house or the park and, or ride four wheelers, you know, just like your average, when he was home, of course, just your average dad, just your, you know, average good dad. So, you know, what a lot of our listeners may not realize is, you know, it sounds like your father, you know, he didn't look at himself as a celebrity. I mean, he's out at the park, he's out at, you know, the local pizza place, he's there with his kids, he's being a family man. You know, nowadays, really, unfortunately, you can't do that. You got paparazzi around. Everybody wants a picture. Everybody wants an autograph. It's harder to be, you know, like out in public when you're a celebrity. But it sounds like back then, maybe it was a little bit easier for him or maybe it was just something that he was used to and he enjoyed it. Uh, Probably a little of both. I mean, you know, nowadays, like, you know, cameras on phones and the Internet and stuff and, you know, I was a kid in the 90s, and so we didn't really, you know, have all the technology like we do today, so it was a little bit easier to escape, you know, um, but really, we lived in kind of a, a small town, and, and so everybody already knew him, so he got to kind of hide out um, a little bit, and it wasn't as bad, and um, I think people were a little nicer back then, too, and, you know, let you kind of go throughout your day and let you mind your own business and stuff. So um, it, I think it was easier than it, it would be today. Today it would just be crazy. Probably couldn't go hardly anywhere, so, you know, without getting on the Internet for doing something or, you know, people just trying, like the paparazzi trying to make you mad and stuff, and it just wouldn't end up really good. Now we talked about um... – a little bit, you know, you talk about, you were in the, you grew up, you were born in 89, so 90s, your father was over in Japan with, you know, Hanson, Steve Williams, you know, just legendary names. I mean, these names are a who's who of, you know, professional wrestling. But here in the 80s, you know, in Texas, well, your father was a member of the Freebirds, and we all know the Freebirds Von Eric rivalry, and you you know as well as I do, there's been some recent incidents. Von Eric fans are still a little, uh, are, are very loyal and they're very, you know, loyal for the Von Ericks, and they're very much against the Freebirds. And I'm sure you've had a few encounters <laughs> with, uh, yeah. with with some of these people that, you know what, maybe they take it just a little too far. Yeah, I have I have received um, some backlash from VE Nation, Von Eric Nation, definitely. So, um, yeah, with one of the matches in Denton, I mean, you know, it. It is what it is, but, uh, yeah, Von Eric Nation definitely stepped up, and they're not liking me right now. <laughs> so, but they're strong. They're, they're real. They're all about it. So that's, that's an army right there. Oh, mo- most definitely, most definitely. Um, I, I interact with some of the members all the time, and I'm just amazed by the loyalty that they have, as well as loyalty to, you know, the Freebirds. They're just, they've got just as much a loyal fan base as, uh, you know, anybody, even, you know, 30 years down around I me, mean, it was 1983, 82, when uh, the cage door, your father, when your father slammed the cage door and carried Von Eric, you know, 30 something years ago, almost 40 years ago, and it's still, you know, in people's minds. People still remember, people know where they were. 
if they were there, they remember being there. They remember the electricity in the room. And that is something to say, you know, 40 years down the road that, you know, this is something that is still remembered. And, you know, you know, your father was part of that. I mean, that's got to be something that you're really proud of. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, you know, like I said, you know, when people come up and tell me their stories and like, I can see the smiles and they're just, you know, like how they felt and stuff. Like, I love hearing that. And because, my dad had a little piece in their life, and even though it could have been one night or they spent every Saturday night at this auditorium, you know, like, it made an impact, and they still want to talk about it, like, decades later, and that's so awesome. Now, Glenn, I'll, I'll explain a little bit to you here about the, you know, her and I are talking this BE Nation. Sure, sure. Von Eric Nation is a kind of a worldwide type of thing, and I'll give you an example of something. This is back in August. Uh, it was about the night before I'm supposed to do going to a, a benefit show for a, for Andy Dalton. He's a wrestler here in the Fort Worth area, mm-hmm. and we were doing a benefit show for him. And the night before, Miranda is at a show with Randy Wayne. Randy Wayne is going to be a guest on our show eventually. Uh, great guy. But Randy Wayne took a cowbell upside Marshall Von Eric's head. I know this because I woke up Sunday morning, and I had about 50 notifications on my phone because I'm members of all these different groups, because I follow all the Texas area and all the different loyalty well, groups. Well, sure, sure. And I had 50 notifications. That's because crazy. there were people who wanted to hang Randy Wayne and wanted to go after Miranda Gordy because they hit a Von Eric in the head with a cowbell. I love and that. I are, love that heat. Yeah. They're loyal. They're loyal. <laughs> That's the kind of heat that would probably make Miranda's dad very, very proud. I mean, because he, he, he I mean, you talked about the impact of the, the Von Eric Freebird feud. I mean, forget about it. We're still be, we're still able to watch it. Generations are able to watch this feud uh, now, you know, thanks to uh, you know YouTube and the WWE Network. And I, I just want to uh, ask a few questions, kind of uh, get my little place in here, uh, uh, Miranda. I want to talk about your dad. And when you think about it, your dad was what you know into his mid-teens barely into his mid-teens when he got into the pro wrestling business so it was a life that that was the only really life he knew as, as as a professional up until his his untimely passing but could you just think about that how you know when you were 14 could you imagine that like you could uh, walk in the shoes of your father when he was that young and and get into the, the lifestyle of what pro wrestling is the the cutting his teeth the working under a, a, an alias name i mean the name tony mecca does doesn't exactly sound like somebody uh, born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I mean, your dad just is so young. It just amazes me. Did it amaze you when you come to think about just the, the, the gravity of the situation? When, when you, you know, think about when you were his age and, and the things that you were doing as opposed to what he did? Now, I have thought about that so many times because he was actually 13. He left high school oh, wow. and um, he started wrestling because he was so tall. Um, you know, people thought he was an adult, but I think about, yeah, what I was doing at 13, 14, 15 and, you know, just normal teenage stuff, but he was already getting into wrestling and, and that was his whole life, you know, from 13 until 40 when he passed, like that's literally all he did. That was his, his life. So I think about that and that's, it's just huge. Like that's, you know, doing that and just that i mean of course you know you you have friends and family on the side but just wrestling your whole life wow yeah Yeah, i think about it and it's just uh he was like a fish to water when you think about it though to be able to have that size and at that age and you know working uh these these territories that said you know being becoming a man at a very young age but when i think about you know those early days i also you know and and throughout terry's career for the a good part i think about a guy who was with him nearly from the beginning who really caught fire with him on you know these national telecasts on wtbs in the early 80s way before uh, you were merely a twinkle in his eye uh, on uh, the old world Championship, Georgia Championship Wrestling shows. I'm, I'm talking about the relationship and the dynamic of, of, of Michael Hayes and, and how that really altered the course of both their careers, uh, their coupling, and the way they worked together through the years. And then, of course, with the addition of Buddy down the line, just how close those guys were as far as, you know, getting into the business and how that uh, relationship expanded through the years, uh, not only in the ring, but outside of the ring. Yeah. And I mean, Michael and I are still close. So. You know, my dad and him were were basically brothers, you know, and and, uh, Michael, I call him Uncle Michael. He's kind of 
you know, like a somewhat of a second dad. He's just kind of always been in my life. So I'm still close to him. But as far as their relationship, yeah, they both met young and like, it's like meant to be. So, and, and they hit it off and exploded on the scene and, you know, just did great things. And then of course, Buddy, like you said, came along later, but yeah, definitely my dad and Michael were just something, you know, together. So you know, the way they bursted onto onto the scene and the way uh, that the timing worked out for them because they were still able to thrive in what was the, the territory days be, before uh, Vince McMahon kind of took it over. These were guys that were able to, uh, you know, not only hit your world classes, but your Georgia championships. You know, they were I mean, even up in my neck of the woods when I started watching uh, wrestling my first few years. I remember seeing them on AWA telecast and eventually for that brief run with the WWF. I mean, there was a lot of freedom uh, in those days. And they built such a great reputation, even down in Florida too. I mean, of, of being such a draw in these territories and such instant either heat magnets, or you could split those guys apart, and they could have some really amazing matches together and build up some some major major audiences uh, in whatever territory those guys traveled in. Oh yeah, heat was their you know their thing. <laughs> they were professionals at that uh, mostly. So definitely the territories. Yeah, that was, uh, like you said, and it built it up, and it and it became just this, you know, like the fabulous Freebirds, and they were. They were absolutely, you know, everything that you just said. Oh, and, and you think about it, though. How many, uh, you know, kids can, can say that their dad was not only this world-class international pro wrestling superstar, but also, thanks to old Uncle Michael... He got himself involved in, uh, I guess, in the video for a song that became synonymous with the Freebirds. I, I know you've probably uh, had that one in your ear a few times, Bad Street USA. So you could say that your dad was a video star, too, in that era. Uh, yeah, Michael's uh, rock star days. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, oh, I've only heard Bad Street a million times. Um yeah, definitely. The, it's a cool because people see that as a music video, not even as far as wrestling, but they were kind of like rock stars making a music video, too. So, you know, both scenes. Pretty cool. Yeah, that is you know, pretty cool. I mean, not too many of you, uh, the people, the kids in your, your class probably in grade school can can really uh, attest to say, hey, man, I not only had a rocker, I had a wrestling dad. So uh, your game of top that is going to have to be really, really good as far as your top that game. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but I got to ask you, though, too, with your dad, you know, with the traveling and stuff and, and hitting territories and, and, and building up his name and legend. I, I know that you uh, came up, you were born in 89, so you were around for his WCW or NWA and in the international stuff. What was like life like uh, when, when dad had to go away for these extended periods of time, especially with uh, the international stuff that he did with Doc and with the Miracle Violence uh, connection? I mean, to be away from uh, from your kids and to be away from dad i mean what was what was like like i mean how did you guys get about uh with you know uh, i mean i guess it became kind of par for the course but what was life really like personally now you know not to have dad around all the time in those initial years um well you know it just made us miss him more and and when he was home it was you know dad time not uh you know wrestling time um so that's kind of like i have more dad stories than wrestling stories um which might be good parenting, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, like I said, I missed him, but it was always like so much fun. It was like an adventure going to the airport when he'd come back from somewhere and, you know, he'd surprise him. He'd come through the gate and, you know, that was fun. And um, uh, just, you know, uh, when he was home, we'd do all the fun stuff then because it was his break time. Like, he would be in Japan three weeks, and then he'd be home three weeks, and that three weeks was awesome. Like I said, we got a four-wheeler one year. <laughs> so, um, you know, we'd ride the four-wheeler, or, like, one Christmas he was home, and that was, like, I still remember that Christmas because we couldn't even touch the tree. There was just rows of toys. So, like, I didn't mind, like, you know, we just knew that it was it, dad's job. That's what he does. I get lots of toys from it. It's cool. <laughs> so I got to ask you, 
what made you, I mean, you've been uh, kind of uh, dabbling into the pro wrestling business. Uh, I know that your brother was involved with it, but what what made you decide to get into it? And what can you remember, first of all, of, of, of your brother, uh, Ray, deciding to uh, uh, you know make it a second generation Gordy thing? Because uh, Ray had a pretty good little, little run. I thought he was a heck of a talent. And how did that make you decide from seeing Ray's experience get into the pro wrestling business? So we'll get into a, a little bit of the sibling uh, talk here as we uh, uh, talk about growing up Gordy. Right. Um, yeah, my brother actually, um, he's actually 10 years older than me. Um, so just like a majority of my life, he was wrestling. So as far as I can remember, you know, just training, he went over to Japan for a while and he was just always in it. And, you know, I was so proud of him, uh, always so proud of him, but you know, he, I remember watching him debut on the WWE back in 2007 and that was just so awesome I like made all my friends watch it (laughs) um but as far as me I never really I mean of course I've always kind of somewhat been involved but I never really like wanted to wrestle and and be super involved but I don't know I just woke up one day and decided you know what I am getting older this seems kind of fun now um actually went to a show, uh, Jerry Bostick with World Class Revolution invited me to a show, and I had such a good time, I'm like, you know what, I think that it's time, I think that it's time to get involved, and so I just happened to, at the same time, meet, you know, Randy Wayne, and he was like, hey, let's do it, and we just kind of, you know, catapulted in, and, and he's been really cool with helping me out, and you know, getting me involved, like, with the managing, I manage him, and, you know, the training and stuff like that, so now it's just kind of like, uh, I don't really have any set goals, I just want to be a part of it, you Mm -hmm. know, so that's what I'm doing, I'm being a part of it now. And I have to ask you, though, what was it like to to go in there into your, into your, your, your father and your brother's business, taking the actual bumps and, and, and building up your stamina? Of course, cardio is a big factor, too, in wrestling. But taking all the bumps and getting your body ring ready. Talk about just some of the stuff that you've been experiencing going through the training process uh, as you're, you're, you're developing this career. Oh, man, I've been sore. <laughs> uh, just waking up sore um, is really, but I like it. You know, I like it. It shows me that I've done something, you know, like, oh, my arm hurts, but that's cool because I took a good bump yesterday or I learned to do this new move. Um, so I enjoy it just, you know, the the physical activity. So I've always, you know, worked out my whole life. So it's, you know, it's been fun it's fun to do that and it's good exercise um and i'm definitely going to continue and grow and you know learn and hopefully get like really really good of course you know uh michael actually called uh the other night and he's like you know what's your goal what are you going to do with it and i was like okay first off i'm never going to be dad i'm never going to be terry gordy but you know i can be i can be miranda gordy and i can be good so that's that's just kind of what I'm going with going with the flow, but I can be good. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> Hey, that's the best attitude you can really take though, instead of just, you know, letting that shadow uh, you know, mess with your head. It's you you're able to take the name, you're able to carve your niche, but you're you're also you're aware of your history, but you're not being swallowed by your history. And I think that's a route that some of the second generation guys, some some have have, have been sucked in by that, while others have, have flourished both in male and, and female competition. Oh, yeah. Like, I I know absolutely, like, not only I won't be in a Gordy, I won't uh, fill his shoes, but there's probably not anyone that Harley can do it. And that's, you know, like I said, I might be being biased, but he was just one of the, he's a legend. So to do that, you got to just be off the charts. So... You know, I like I said, I'll, I'll be Miranda Gordy. I'll be Terry Gordy's daughter, but I'll I'll do my thing too. Have you uh, seeked out any other advice? I mean, you talked with Michael. Has there been any other veterans who who know that you're 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 cutting your teeth here in the business that have uh, given you uh, a few minutes? Uh, you know, have lent you a little bit of advice. And have there been other people that you have been? You know, like you said you've been training. You've been working some of these indies. Have you been gleaning some 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 wisdom here as you're you're kind of moving on and kind of getting your own niche here in pro wrestling? Who have been kind of helpful with, with words and also encouragement and other things like that? Um, honestly, um, 
of course, Michael, uh, you know, he called and he's like, well, I know you want some advice, <laughs> you know, being Michael. Um, so I was like, sure, give me some advice. But uh, someone who has been encouraging, uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Actually, him and I did a show uh, in Denton. It's probably been about a month now at UNT. Uh, but he was all about it. He's like, oh, my, you know, you're starting to train and I'm pulling for you. And, and you know, because him and my dad were friends. Oh, so of he he was super encouraging. Um, a lot of the wrestlers, just a lot of indie people have, you know, just been like, yeah, we're, you know, we're pulling for you. So it's, you know, uh, that makes me feel good. It makes me feel confident and like, you know, keep going. And, and so no one has really given anything negative. No one's been, Oh, you just want to shadow your dad or, you know, just want to try to do that. No one has been like that at all towards me. Miranda, if your dad was still around, you know, how, what would he think of his daughter continuing on with the legacy with the Gordy name and getting into the business? Um, he would tell me to, like, be a doctor instead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> he really, well, you know, it, it can be a really hard business and, um, you know, sometimes people get chewed up and spit out, and I know that he would just want me to have, like, a really good career and be happy, and, and he, you know, he would just be looking out for me. But, of course, uh, you know, the Gordy, I'd, I'd stand up and I'd be like, no, nah, I want to do this, and he would push me and encourage me and, and be proud of me and be proud that I want to carry on the legacy and stuff. Now, on previous shows, um, I've had a chance to interview your mother, Wonderful woman, by the way. Tell her I said hello. Um, she's talked about, you know, your dad. And we talked about the Hall of Fame, going into the WWE Hall of Fame. And he's in the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. All the Hall of Fames and all the recognition he's gotten. She said that, you know, he would have looked at that and he would have been kind of humbled by it. That he really wouldn't have been that guy. Like, he probably he wouldn't have wanted to be up on that stage in the, in the suit and tie accepting the award for the Hall of Fame. Because that just wasn't. That wasn't your dad. Your dad was a humble type of guy. You know, do, do you agree with that? Or do you think that maybe he might have been a little more accepting or maybe kind of enjoyed some of the uh, recognition with the Hall of Fame and all that? Oh, uh, first of all, I cannot see my dad in a suit and tie. Um, <laughs> no, I think, well, you know, as far as like, Hall of Fame either, so. exactly. That's what I mean. No, my dad was a really humble person. Um, as far as definitely not a tuxedo, I don't, I can't even imagine him in a tuxedo, but as far as like a suit and tie, he might wear, you know, something kind of nice, untucked shirt though, um, possibly cowboy boots or flip flops, you know, no dress shoes. Um, but I think he would be super humble. He might go and, and, you know, thank everybody that, um, had a part and getting, you know, helping him and his career out. Um, do I think it would go to his head or, you know, he would, you know, have some sort of like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a legend. No, absolutely not. No, I think that he would, you know, pay his respects, pay his dues for, for people that have got and do it for the fans. You know, he would show up for, for everyone that wanted him to be there. That's why he would show up. He probably couldn't care less. Oh, it's another you know, another trophy, another award, something like that. But but he would he would do it for everyone else. He'll let Michael go and accept all that, you know. We'll, yeah. <laughs> no. uh, I, Michael loves it. <laughs> Michael loves all of it. <laughs> well, him and Jimmy with that yeah, dance yeah, number yeah, that yeah. they did, man. Oh, my Lord. Uh, I bet Terry would have probably uh, uh, gave him a give him a little bit of a ribbing after that uh boy him and jimmy dancing around in their late 50s and you know jimmy's almost what near 60 now it was it was kind of a fun little nostalgia trip but then i hope that jimmy uh wasn't going to have himself an aortic event because boy he was out of breath during that uh inter or during the induction ceremony yeah <laughs> um yeah and i hadn't seen jimmy in a long time so um but you know i think they did really good and and that night, you know, I was there, and we all dressed up, and it was just super emotional, very proud, but very, you know, sad because we missed them. And um, I don't think that 
my dad would have any part of the dancing, though. I don't think that he would be a part of that. Buddy, maybe. So, may you know, a fifty-fifty chance with Buddy. So, oh, very, very, very. Now, did cool. you sing along with Michael at the end? Did you sing along with Bad Street like all the rest of the the, the audience did? I did not. I was more like, oh, no, he didn't. I mean, like, Ray had clued me in that this was going to happen. But, you know, in the moment, you're just like, oh, my, is he really? Because I see him like a second dad. So it's just like, imagine your dad up there acting goofy. And it's like, oh, no. (laughs) So, but I mean, it was good. You know, he did a good job. And he was really happy to do it. So, so that's what matters. He got to he got to get that out one more time. Now we're getting close to the end of our uh, interview. I'm going to pass it back over to Glenn here in a few minutes. But I'm sure our listeners would be interested. You said the fans come up to you and you know they tell you some of their favorite stories and all that. And what are some of the 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 wrestling stories that you heard about your dad that you could share with some of our listeners? Some of the ones you've enjoyed. And did your father have a version of the Cheyenne Social Club story? Because I've only heard Michael's side. Um, which story is that? Which is that would be the one which, with the man with the wooden leg and fire and the gun. The one he told us. Oh, um, now I've heard all of these Freebird stories, um, of course, a thousand times, but it changes a little bit. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure how you know, my dad's version would go. It'd probably be similar, maybe even a little bit funnier. Um, But yeah, I've heard the story and I've heard the, it might be the same story. The guy was bragging in the bathroom. Um, He had three bullets with their names on it. And um, luckily he was bragging about it and he got caught because that could have been, you know, the end of everything, a real tragedy. Um, of course, I've heard that story, the story, the story of, um, you know, the entrance music, and um, I think that gets funnier every time Michael tells it, uh, you know, they were waiting on the guy, and the guy just hit it right, right on the the right spot, because it was, uh, you know, vinyls back then, and, and so I've heard that. Um, all the stories of my dad are the, are my favorite. Um, <laughs> I love them all. There's um, there's so many. Just you know him being. I like you know when people tell me. Um, I like their feelings from it is what I enjoy the most. And you know there's hundreds of stories from the sportatorium or or you know all Japan and stuff. I like them all. Now you've also got a. Uh you have an online store. You've actually got some merchandise, you know, for your dad. I believe there's a, there's a Terry Gordy t-shirt and all that that you have available. Um, can you tell our listeners kind of something about that, where they can find this in case, cause I know I'd like to have one. Oh yes. Um, it's on Etsy. Um, Amazon missed out because they, I don't know. I could not, uh, get signed on to Amazon to save my life. So I was like, okay, Etsy it is. Um, it's Gordy merchandise, like one big word. If you type that into Etsy, um, you can order a shirt. I, people have asked me for years, like, you know, do you have Terry Gordy shirts? And, um, pretty much I just took one of the originals that he actually wore. And, you know, I had, uh, you know, one, a a t-shirt of, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to get these done. You know, nothing special. It's an original. People want it. So I got it made. And, you know, it's been doing really well. So, but yeah, Gordy Merchandise. One one big word on Etsy. E-T-S-Y. <laughs> okay. And if our, for our fans here in the Texas area, and all that, what, what's upcoming for Miranda Gordy? Where can they find you next? Oh, um, all around DFW. Uh, DCW. um the Heroes of Wrestling, HOW, um, Texoma Pro is coming up um, in like two weeks. That's in Sherman. Um, hopefully uh, some world-class revolution stuff pretty soon. So 
they travel all around, uh, but hopefully something with them soon. Um, just, you know, wherever. I, I'm kind of showing up wherever now, just wherever. Everybody's, like, wanting a piece of me, so I'm showing up. <laughs> all right, Glenn, I'm going to hand the microphone back over to you now. Man. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. And uh, Miranda, we'll uh, chat a little bit before it's uh, time to put the wraps on that, uh, on this edition of uh, Rasslin' Memories. And, uh, wow, I, you know, when we talk about the, the second generation guy, you know, people, you know, working in the Indies, uh, it was just last year, uh, I got a chance to talk with Brian Pillman, the second, Brian Pillman Jr., and he was talking about how he was starting to uh, cut his teeth in the business and, and find his niche, and now I'm seeing him on uh, on TV uh, uh, via the MLW uh, promotion down there in Florida with Court Bauer, but I want to talk about just how prosperous the indies are these days in this era in 2018 with so many opportunities that are available to a talent like yourself and, and some of the many others who are uh, trying to find their way i mean this has to be a, i mean it's not necessarily w the way it was we can't uh, put that genie back in the bottle but you know now you got such a good chance to really get yourself out there with social media and uh, all these different pro wrestling companies it's just a really uh, a really boom period for for indies and a really great opportunity for you to uh, kind of blossom Oh, absolutely. Like, like I said, this really, you know, just started, um, I found Randy back in, I think it was July and you know, it's only, uh, October. So it's already blown up and I was amazed at how fast it blew up, but you're right. The, the Indians have come like a long way. So, um, and it's a lot of fun and it's, I like it a lot more, you know, than, than like watching, I mean, not there's anything wrong with WWE, but I like it a lot. So, because you see a lot of good things in the indies, a lot of talent, you know, and, and you can go to different promotions and see different things and, and the storylines and stuff. So I'm definitely digging the indies right now. And, and like you said, social media just makes things just, you know, blow up. It's definitely had a hand in making the world smaller, but doing it for for good thing, good causes, especially with with pro wrestling, uh, you know, with keeping the independence up. I mean, again, you want to talk about a, a second generation when you're talking about you know guys that are kind of bucking the uh, WWE trend. Uh, when you got a kid like Cody, a guy like Cody Rhodes uh, who is working with these guys and, and selling out an arena in the Chicagoland area without uh, the big arm of, of of Vince McMahon. I mean, those are little things that 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 really kind of can help and and really kind of put that kick in the pants to the indies is that some of these guys, these second generation, third generation guys who, uh, you know, learn from their fathers or their, or their, or their mothers in certain cases have learned, uh, you know, what pro wrestling was like from that perspective and are able to kind of apply what they may have learned through the years from their father and some of the other influences. So I'm really liking kind of the, uh, the vibe with the nod to yesterday, but we're living in today with uh, the way these, sec some of these second generation people are really starting to find their spot in the world and, of wrestling. And I'm definitely thinking, with uh, more time and, and time and time and time, you're going to find yourself in it's that sort of position. So it's really cool to to keep these names going in the pro wrestling business. It's it's almost like a legacy, a birthright. Oh, absolutely, and that that's really my main goal is just you know continue with the legacy, just keep it going. I mean, not that it couldn't do it on its own, but I'm proud to to be a part of of keeping the spirit alive. So. And we're so happy to have you on the program. Uh, it's so nice to, to, to get a different perspective uh, about life with a pro wrestling legend uh, from, from a kid's uh, vantage point and, and what you saw with your dad and, and just, you know, how, how short his, his life truly was and just how many of the really good moments you got to have with him and how you're really kind of returning the favor and uh, keeping his name alive and, 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 and just expanding upon uh, the legend of a guy who I thought was one of the, the lightest big man in the business. You couldn't get any better that guy could cook your dad was awesome oh and he was an artist he was an artist at his job absolutely he was amazing like i said like he's one of my favorite even you know he's people's favorite just because like no bias just he's just he was good really really good you know, and, you know, it's just so amazing his story about, you know, being this young teenager, finding his way through wrestling, getting such international acclaim, he being a star in the United States as well, and, and, and just what a, what a, what a life uh, he, he did lived. He, he lived probably two or three lifetimes in his short uh, time uh, compared to some people who probably haven't lived the way he, uh, he lived and the experiences that he had. Oh, I agree with that, absolutely. 
Well, yeah, you got to see the world, you know, so. <laughs> well, yeah, not bad for a kid from Chattanooga, you know. I mean, I, I, it must have been mind-blowing uh, for him to, uh, you know, when he first went over and did these Asian tours and just what a legend that he became. Something that uh, he didn't, I mean, he was successful here in the States, don't get me wrong, but it was just a different level. It was kind of the way, you know, it was for, for Steve Williams, his partner, and the way it was for, for Stan, just an example, with working with guys like, you know, Giant Baba or Antonio Inoki. I mean, Japan was just a whole different game back then and, and really brought him such great great fame i mean it's legendary status i mean this was stuff that started back in the day with the destroyer but your dad was definitely one of those that when they look back they think of you know hard hitters they thought strong style guys terry gordy was the man i mean along with doc oh yeah yeah and i you know, like as a kid like i said uh all japan was kind of what i grew up with but like even now, I think that is my favorite Terry Gordy, is the All Japan Terry Gordy. So, because I think he was just his healthiest, and that was his real prime. You know, he came up with the Freebirds, but I think that was his real prime. It was, he was an, an athlete. He was a, you know, big man. So that, I think All Japan is my favorite Terry Gordy. You know, and I think that was just a way that he was able to kind of step out and have that second act beyond the Freebirds. And, and what a second act. I mean, you're talking about in his prime when he leaned down with him and Doc. I mean, we got a taste of that here in the States when they were uh, working uh, for uh, World Championship Wrestling with, with during Bill Watts's era. With They had some great matches with the Steiner brothers and, 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 and uh, you know, Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham. So we got a little bit of a taste of, of what the Orient uh, we're, we're, we're drinking in and loving with these guys, and it was just such a good time for wrestling and a good time for his career. Oh, yes, absolutely, for sure. Okay, it's time. Uh, the timekeeper's given me the eye, and it is time to wrap up this edition of Wrestling Memories. A big, 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 huge thank you to uh, Miranda Gordy for taking some time out of her uh, busy schedule to uh, share some memories of her dad, but to also enlighten us about her own wrestling uh, trials, travails, ups and downs, and future successes. Michael McCurdy, the uh, grizzled vet, I thank you so much for uh, setting up this interview as well, my friend. It's been a fun time at Wrestling Memories yet again. Always enjoy, you know, and like I said, a couple weeks ago, we had Mark James on and said, you know, we need to get some memories from a different perspective or you're just telling kind of the same story. And I think Miranda gave us a different perspective on, you know, Terry Gordy and the Freebirds and, you know, the Miracle Violence Connection. I think we got a different side of the story. So I think we might have done a little bit of what Mark James suggested we did. And I think uh, we, we follow a good lead. For Miranda Gordy and the grizzled veteran Michael McCurdy, I'm Glenn Broggett. You've been listening to Rasslin' Memories Then and Now.